This is lecture 115 in the ABCs of Communism series, supporting the forthcoming volume 7 on Communism in Europe. Uh, and our lecture this morning is on Napoleon Leads France, Capitalism Overtakes Europe. As Great Britain was still at war with France, a plan was made to take Egypt from the Ottoman Empire, a British ally. This was Napoleon's idea, and the Directorate agreed not the least reason for their support of Napoleon's plan was to get the popular general away from France. By this time it was clear that the massive army held the real power should it care to use it. On 21 July 1798, Napoleon defeated the Ottoman forces during the Battle of the Pyramids. He then sent hundreds of scientists and linguists to explore the doc and document ancient and modern Egypt. From the 1st to the 3rd of August, 1798, the British fleet under Admiral Horatio Nelson surprised and destroyed the French fleet at the Battle of the Nile. Napoleon planned to move into Syria but was defeated and returned to France without his army. In 1798, the Directorate was threatened by another foreign plot to restore the monarchy. The Prussian and Austrian crowns would not accept their territorial losses. In 1799, the Russian Tsarist army expelled the French from Italy at Cassano, while the Austrian army defeated the French in Switzerland at Stokach and Zurich. The Directorate was in trouble and needed Napoleon back in France. Napoleon was in trouble in Egypt and needed to get out of there. For once, the two had overriding interests that were in harmony with each other. Now, on October 9, 1799, Napoleon had made his way secretly back to France. He had with him his most loyal men. The rest would have to be evacuated from Egypt later. On the 9th of November, 1799, Napoleon overthrew the French regime, regime and seized power for himself. In 1800, Napoleon defeated the Austrian army at the Battle of Marengo and at the Battle of Hohenlinden. At sea, the French had success at Boulogne. In 1801, Nelson's Royal Navy destroyed an anchored Danish and Norwegian fleet at the Battle of Copenhagen because the Scandinavian kingdoms were against the British blockade of France. Soundly beaten, the monarchs agreed to peace in two treaties. First, the Treaty of Lunaville and the Second Treaty of Amiens. In 1801, Napoleon concluded a treaty with Pope Pius VII, opening peaceful relations between church and state. The church did not get its lands back. Bishops and clergy were receiving government salaries, and the government would pay for the building and maintenance of the churches. The Pope was happy just to get relief from the criminal sanctions of the revolution. Napoleon simultaneously reorganized higher learning by dividing the Institut National into four academies. From 1802 to 1803, there was an interlude of peace during which Napoleon sold French Louisiana to the United States. The Louisiana Territory was indefensible, and Napoleon needed the money. In 1804, Napoleon was titled Emperor by the Senate, founding the first French Empire. Napoleon's rule was much more advanced than traditional European monarchies of the time, and the proclamation of the French Empire was met by the Third Coalition against France. In 1805, the French army was renamed La Grande Armée. Napoleon's propaganda emphasized the ideals of the revolution and was powerful. Capitalism under Napoleon. Napoleon centralized power in Paris with all the provinces governed by and all powerful, the all-powerful prefects he selected. They were more powerful than their equivalents under the old order. They conducted affairs efficiently and unified the nation, minimizing regional differences and cleared all decisions to the new boss in Paris. Napoleon resolved the outstanding religious problems to his satisfaction and accordingly he shifted the clergy and most Catholics from hostility to the government to support for him. Pope Pius VII agreed with his policies because he had no choice and church life returned to normal. Pius did not get the church lands restored because the farmers would not have stood for that and the Pope accepted what had happened. However, the Jesuits were allowed back in and that was as much as the Roman boss could hope for. 
Protestants, Jews, and atheists were permanently legal. In the 1790s, the revolutionary government seized and sold church lands and lands of exiled aristocrats, as we have seen. Napoleon instituted a modern, efficient tax system that guaranteed a steady flow of revenues and made long-term financing possible. Napoleon kept the system of conscription that had been created in the 1790s so that every young man served in the army, which could be rapidly expanded even as it was based on a corps of careers and talented officers. Before the revolution, the aristocracy formed the officer corps. Now promotion was by merit and achievement so that every private carried a marshal's baton, quote unquote. The modern era of French education began in the 1790s when the revolution abolished the traditional universities. Napoleon replaced them with new specialized institutions. For example, the École Polytechnique fo focused on technology. Of permanent importance, the Napoleonic Code was written by eminent jurists under, under Napoleon's supervision. Praised for its clarity, it spread rapidly throughout Europe and eventually the world. It marked the end of feudalism and the liberation of serfs. It recognized the principles of civil liberty, equality before the law, and the secular character of the state. It discarded the old right of primogeniture, where the only the eldest son inherited, and required that inheritances be divided equally among all the children. The court system was standardized and judges appointed by the government in Paris. France spreads capitalism in Napoleon's image. On 19 October 1805, Napoleon scored an astonishing victory at Ulm, and an entire Austrian army was captured. On 21 October 1805, Napoleon's fleet was defeated at Tra Trafalgar, however. For the moment, Britain was, the safe, was safe from invasion. Russell Crowe's movie, Master and Commander, The Far Side of the World, gives an excellent cinematic portrayal of that moment when French tactics at sea in using privateers proved extremely difficult to handle. However, it was on the ground that this war would be won. On the 2nd of December in 1805, Napoleon inflicted a catastrophic defeat on the Austrian and Russian empires at Austerlitz that destroyed their third coalition. Peace was agreed in the Treaty of Pressburg. The Austrian boss lost the title of Holy Roman Emperor. The Confederation of the Rhine was created by Napoleon incorporating the former Austrian territories. The tide had turned. Nevertheless, Prussia joined Britain and Russia to form a fourth coalition, and it had allies. The French Empire was not alone, as, as, it, is, as it now had its own network of allies and other client states. Then in 1806, a largely outnumbered French army crushed the Prussian army at Gina Arstedt. Napoleon captured Berlin, and went as far as eastern Prussia. 1807 was a fateful year, and on 14 June 1807, the Russian Empire was defeated at the Battle of Friedland. Napoleon then dictated the peace in the Tilsit Treaties. Russia had to join Napoleon's continental system, and Prussia handed half its territories to France. The Duchy of Warsaw was formed over these territorial losses, and Polish troops entered with his Grand Armée. In order to ruin the British economy, Napoleon had created the Continental System that year and tried to prevent merchants across Europe from trading with the British. The Brits and newly independent Americans were experts in smuggling. Consequently, Napoleon's strategy against Britain was less effective than he had imagined it would be, and at any rate, two countries, Sweden and Portugal, remained neutral. In the 1807 Treaty of Fontainebleau, a French-Spanish alliance against Portugal was sealed. When the Spanish proved inept, French armies entered Spain to conduct the war against Portugal. Still, the Spanish so-called army was incapable of carrying its weight, and Napoleon sent his brother, Joseph Bonaparte, to take things in hand. He did so, forcing the incompetent King Charles to abdicate. Joseph was made of King of Spain as placeholder for his brother, and the army of Charles was so incompetent that the real resistance came from angered civilians. So in July of 1808, guerrillas defeated Joseph's army at the Battle of Bailen. In August of 1808, French forces evacuated Portugal, but they remained firmly in control of Catalonia and Navarre. Napoleon returned and recovered much of Spain. Then a fifth coalition against France was formed in Austria. 
In April 1809, the forces of reaction defeated the French at Aspert Essling, but were beaten at Wagram. Then Napoleon's Polish allies defeated the Austrian Empire at Racin. The peace treaty in October 1809 stripped Austria of much of its territory. In 1812, war broke out with Russia. Napoleon assembled the largest army Europe had ever seen. It included troops from all his client states as prepared on the Polish frontier. Following an exhausting march and a bloody but inconclusive battle at Borodino near Moscow, the Grand Army entered and captured Moscow. The Russians had left the city burning. Occupation without sufficient supplies was not practical and the Napoleonic Army left Russia in late 1812. Then the Russian winter, exhaustion and scorched earth warfare annihilated it. In June of 1813 on the Spanish front, French troops were defeated at Vitoria. In August of 1813 after the battle, after the Battle of the Pyrenees, French troops were taken from Spain. The Sixth Coalition was formed under British leadership. The German states of the Confederation of the Rhine switched sides to oppose Napoleon. In October 1813, Napoleon was defeated outside Leipzig. In February 1814, he lost the Six Days Campaign, although the Allies suffered much higher casualties. The, empire was not, the Emperor was now without sufficient men in what remained of his army. On the 6th of April in 1814, Napoleon was forced to abdicate and was exiled to the island of Elba. Anticlimax Napoleon suddenly returned, seized control of France, raised an army, and marched on his enemies in the Hundred Days. It ended with his final defeat at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815 and his exile to a remote island in the Atlantic. The Reactionary Monarchist Congress of Vienna reversed the political changes that had occurred during the wars. The French monarchy was restored with Louis XVIII, younger brother of Louis XVI, as king. The capitalist essence of the revolution, however, and the no code Napoleon remained intact. Capitalism after Napoleon France was no longer the dominant power it had been before 1814. The Bourbons were restored but overthrown in 1830. Another royal regime was overthrown in 1848 as Napoleon's nephew was elected president. He made himself emperor as Napoleon III. The Specter of Communism It was a coincidental omen that the Communist Manifesto of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels appeared at the time as workers' rebellion broke out in southern Italy in January 1848. The word spread almost as fast as it does today so that soon all of Europe with working classes was up in arms. In France, workers were extremely pissed off when the Constituent Assembly did not address their issues. Strikes and demonstrations became common as the workers gave vent to their anger. On 15 February 1848, demonstrations reached a climax across France when workers from the secret societies broke out in armed uprising against the anti-labor, anti-democratic policies of the Constituent Assembly and the Provisional Government. In June of 1848, frightened the Provisional Government brought General Louis Eugene Cavignac back from Algeria to kill as many of the workers in armed revolt as he could. From June of 1848 until December 1848, General Cavignac was head of the Provisional Government and he killed a lot of proletarians and their families. And then we came to the Second Republic of 1848 to 1852. On the 10th of December 1848, in the meantime, Louis Napoleon Bonaparte was elected president by a landslide. His support came from a wide section of the French public. Various classes of French society voted for Louis Napoleon. Louis Napoleon ran on being all things to all people one of his promises to the farmers and workers was that there would be no new taxes. The new National Constituent Assembly was as stacked in the voting pool as the gringo federal courts are stacked in their jury pools today. Therefore, it was no surprise that the Assembly was heavily composed of royalists. These came in two flavors, like gringo Republican and Democrat wings of the U.S. Capitalist Congress. In 1848 France there were the legitimate Bourbon wing and the Orleanist, 
uh, wing of C citizen King Louis Philippe. Because of the ambiguity surrounding the Louis Napoleon political position, his slogan, Time for a Change, whatever that means, his agenda was very much in doubt. For a prime minister, he selected Odilon Barot, an unobjectionable middle-of-the-road parliamentarian who had led the loyal opposition under Louis Philippe. Other appointees represented the two royalist factions. The Pope had been forced out of Rome as part of the Revolution of 1848. Louis Napoleon sent a 14,000-man expeditionary force of troops to the Papal State under General Nicholas Charles Victor Oudinot to restore him. In late April 1849, Louis Napoleon's army was defeated and pushed back from Rome by Giuseppe Garibaldi's Volunteer Corps. Then it recovered and captured Rome. In June 1849, demonstrations against the government broke out and were suppressed. The leaders, including prominent politicians, were arrested. The government banned democratic and socialist newspapers in France, and their editors were arrested. Karl Marx was on the run, and in August he made it to London. In early October 1849, the government tried new taxes to balance its budget and reduce its debts. Hippolyte Passy was appointed finance minister. When the Legislative Assembly met, Passy proposed an income tax. The bourgeoisie, who would pay most of the tax, protested loudly. The fear over the income tax caused the resignation of Barrault as prime minister, but the new wine tax caused the protest to continue. The 1850 elections resulted in a conservative body. It passed the Fallot laws, putting primary and secondary education back into the hands of the Catholic Church, uh, clergy and that lasted until the Jules Ferry Laws reversed course in 1879. A new electoral law was passed that disenfranchised three million of France's ten million voters. The Second Empire of 1852 to 1871. As 1851 opened, Louis Napoleon was not allowed by the Constitution of 1848 to seek re-election as President of France. Instead, he proclaimed himself president for life following a coup that was confirmed and accepted in a referendum. Napoleon III of France took the imperial title in 1852 and held it until his downfall in 1870. His administration witnessed a great industrialization, urbanization, and economic growth across the board, including the rebuilding of Paris. Despite his promises in 1852 of a peaceful reign, he led France into foreign imperialist wars. However, he had, done none of, he had none of the skill of his uncle. Nevertheless, Louis Napoleon did have success in strengthening French control over Algeria and elsewhere in Africa. Most importantly, the takeover of Indochina made up for the loss of India. And he opened trade with China. He facilitated a French company building the Suez Canal that Britain could not stop. <coughs> in Europe, however, Louis Napoleon failed repeatedly. The Crimean War of 1854-56 produced no gains. Louis Napoleon had long been focused on Italy and wanted to see it unified under French sponsorship. He plotted with Cavour of the Italian Kingdom of Piedmont to expel Austria and set up an Italian confederation of four new states headed by the Pope. Events in 1859 ran out of his control. Austria was quickly defeated, but instead of four new states, a popular uprising united all of Italy under Piedmont. The Pope held on to Rome only because Napoleon sent troops to protect him. Napoleon III. His reward was the county of Nice that included the city of Nice and the rugged Alpine territory to its north and east, and the Duchy of Savoy. He angered Catholics when the Pope lost most of his domains, and Napoleon then reversed himself and angered both the anti-clerical liberals at home and his erstwhile Italian allies when he protected the Pope of Rome. Meanwhile, Louis Napoleon lowered the tariffs that angered the owners of large estates, textile and iron industrialists, and encouraged workers to organize. Matters grew worse as Louis almost went to war with the United States in 1862, because of his takeover of Mexico in 1861. Lincoln wanted to send the U.S. Army into Mexico immediately, but his generals and admirals convinced him to take care of the rebellion in the U.S. South first. 
The British Caps were angered by Louis' intervention in Syria in 1860-61. In 1867, his puppet emperor he put on the Max Mexican throne was overthrown and executed. He went to the war, war with the Germans in 1870, losing Alsace and Lorraine. Louis Napoleon had alienated everyone at home and abroad, culminating in his failure to obtain an alliance with Austria and Italy. Louis interfered in Korea in 1866, but withdrew from the war with little or no gain. The next year, a French expedition to Japan aimed at helping the Tokugawa shogunate. Then Tokugawa was defeated at the Battle of Toba Fushimi. Following the defeat of France in the Franco-Prussian War, German Chancellor of 1870-71, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck proposed harsh terms for peace, including the return of Alsace and Lorraine. The Third Republic and the Paris Commune A new French assembly was elected to consider the German terms for peace. Elected on 8 February 1871, this new National Assembly had 650 deputies. Sitting in Bordeaux, the French National Assembly established the Third Republic. However, 400 members of the new Assembly were monarchists. Leah Gambetta was one of the non-monarchist Republic Republicans that were elected to the new National Assembly from Paris. On the 16th of February, 1871, Adolphe Thiers was elected as the chief executive of the new Republic. Because of the revolutionary proletarian unrest in Paris, the Thiers government relocated to Versailles. In late 1870 to early 1871, the workers of Paris rose in premature and unsuccessful small-scale uprisings. The National Guard in Paris was defiant of the police, the army chief of staff, and their own National Guard commanders. Thiers immediately recognized a revolutionary situation. In 1870, the Franco-Prussian War broke out. Napoleon III's French Empire was defeated at Metz and Sedan. Louis surrendered himself and 100,000 French troops to the German troops at Sedan on 1 September 1870. On 18 March 1871, Thiers sent regular army units to take control of the cannons that belonged to the National Guard of Paris. However, soldiers of the regular army units fraternized with the rebels, and the revolt, the revolt reached the boiling point. A second 1789 was on horizons when barricades went up. France had witnessed this pre-revolutionary moment twice before in 1830 and 1848. Now the famous Paris Commune was born, about which Karl Marx had so much to say in his analysis of the Civil War in France. Again, the Hotel de Ville, or Town Hall, became the center of attention for the people in revolt. This time, the Hotel de Ville became the seat of the revolutionary government. The revolutionary communes in Lyon, Marseille, and Toulouse felt the full force of the Cap Army of Tears and were crushed. One of the strategic points around Paris was Fort Issy, south of the city, near the Port de Versailles, which blocked the route of the army into Paris. Leon Magie, a former mechanic and a militant Blankist, commanded the garrison of the fort. His leader, Louis-Auguste Blanqui, believed that socialist revolution should be implemented by a small group of secret, well-organized party activists. However, Magie had been caught by the king's secret police and sentenced to 20 years of hard labor. After being freed, he had led the takeover of the prefecture of Marseille by revolutionaries. When the king's guardsmen crushed that uprising in blood, he came back to Paris. The city council concurred in the rank of colonel assigned to him by the Central Committee of the National Guard, and he took command of Fort Issy on 13 April 1871. General Ernest de Sissy fired on Issy for three days and nights. He offered Maggie surrender terms, including the right to go to Paris with their belongings and weapons. Colonel Maggie accepted, and during the night of 29 to 30, April 1871, when news of the evacuation reached the Central Committee of the National Guard and the Commune, the National Guard rushed reinforcements and reoccupied all the positions. General Sissy resumed his intense bombardment of the fort to no avail as the def defenders resisted until the, till the night of 7 to 8, 1781. 7 to 8 May 1781, when the new commander of the National Guard, 
Louis Rossell issued a terse bulletin. The tricolor flag flies over the fort of Issy, abandoned yesterday by the garrison. The abandonment of the fort led the commune to dismiss Rossell and replace him with Della Sluice, a fervent communard journalist, but with no military experience. When the Germans had captured Louis Napoleon, his government in France had to be replaced. The National Assembly had appointed a unity government and placed MacMahon in command of the army. On 19 May 1871, while the Commune Executive Committee was meeting to judge the former military commander, Klaus Array, for the loss of the Issy Fortress, it received word that the forces of the Marshal MacMahon were within the fortifications of Paris. On 20 May 1871, McMahon's artillery batteries and Montretout, Montpellerin, Boulogne, Issy, and Banvis opened fire on the western neighborhoods of Paris at Atul, Passy, and Trocadero with shells falling close to Atoll. Soldiers were said to defend the ramparts of the city between Pont de Jour and Port de Toul, but were forced to retreat into the city. At that point, he had only 4,000 soldiers left at Le Mouet, 2,000 at Neuilly, and 200 at Astier and St. Ouen. On 21 May 1871, McMahon's army began its offensive on Paris. At the front, soldiers learned from a spy inside the walls that the National Guard had withdrawn from one section of the city wall at Pont du Jour. There, the fortifications were undefended. An army engineer crossed the moat and confirmed that the fortifications had been abandoned. He telegraphed that report to Marshal McMahon, who was with President Thiers at Fort Montvalerien. McMahon ordered two battalions to enter the fortifications. Then they occupied the Port de St. Cloud and the Port de Versailles. By 4 o'clock in the morning, 60,000 of his soldiers had passed into the city and occupied Autel and Passy. Each quarter of Paris fought desperately for its survival, but each was overcome in turn. The city center now had wide boulevards. The government forces had a centralized command and superior numbers. They broke through the walls of houses to outflank the communards barricades. The trial of Gustave Clouseret, the former commander, was still going on at the Commune when they received the message from General Dombrowski that the army was inside the city. He asked for reinfor reinforcements and proposed an immediate counterattack. Remain calm, he wrote, and everything will be saved. We must not be defeated." Unquote. When they had received his, this news, the members of the Commune executive returned to their deliberations on the fate of Clouseret, which continued until 8 o'clock that evening. But Dombrowski was wounded in the fighting and died two days later. On 22 May 1871, bells rang around the city. De La Clouse, as war minister of the Commune, issued a proclamation posted all over Paris. It read, quote, In the name of this glorious France, mother of all the popular revolutions, permanent home of the ideas of justice and solidarity, which should be and will be the laws of the world, march at the enemy, and may your revolutionary energy show him that someone can sell Paris, but no one can give it up or conquer it. The Commune counts on you, counts on the com count on the Commune. And the Committee of Public Safety issued its own decree, quote, To arms, Paris is bristling with barricades, and behind these improvised ramparts it will hurl again its cry of war, its cry of pride, its cry of defiance, its cry of victory. Paris, with its barricades, is undefeatable. That revolutionary Paris, that Paris of great days, does its duty. The Commune and the Committee of Public Safety will do theirs. 20,000 persons, including many women and children, responded. The forces of the Commune, however, were outnumbered 5 to 1 by the army of Marshal McMahon. On 22 May 1871, the regular army, that is McMahon's army, occupied a large area from the Port Dauphine to the Champ de Mar and the École Militaire, where General Sissy established his headquarters to the Port de Van Vest. Then the 5th Corps of the Army advanced toward Père Barsou and Place Clichy, while General Douai occupied Place d'Etoile and General 
Clinchant occupied the Gare Saint Lazare. In the west of Paris, the army moved forward cautiously. In the event, when the army entered the city, only a few large barricades were in place. On the Rue Saint Florentine and the Rue de l'Opera and the Rue de Rivoli, elsewhere, barricades had not been prepared in advance, so 900 barricades were quickly built of paving stones and sacks of earth. Other people prepared shelters in their cellars. In the afternoon of 22 May 1871, serious fighting got underway. Artillery of McMahon's regular army batteries on the Quai de Arce and the Madeleine exchanged fire with National Guard batteries on the terrace of the Tuileries Palace. Then the first executions of National Guard soldiers by McMahon's army inside Paris took place. Sixteen prisoners captured on the Rue du Bac were given a summary hearing and shot. On 23 May 1871, the objective of Mac McMahon's army was the Butte of Montmartre, where the uprising had begun. There, the National Guard had built a circle of armed barricades and makeshift forts around the base of the Butte. A battalion of 30 women defended the barricade at Chasse Clignan Court. Included among them was Louise Michel, the celebrated Red Virgin of Montmartre who had participated in many battles outside the city. She was seized by McMahon's soldiers, thrown into a trench in front of the barricade, and left for dead. She escaped soon afterwards but surrendered to the army to prevent the arrest of her mother. The battalions of the National Guard were no match for the army. Later on 23 May 1871, McMahon's soldiers were at the top of Montmartre and his tricolor flag was rose, raised over the Solferino Tower. The soldiers captured 42 guardsmen and several women and shot them. On the Rue Royale, McMahon's soldiers seized 300 soldiers of the barricade around the Madeline Church and shot them. That same day, units of National Guardsmen began taking revenge, burning government buildings. The guardsmen, under Communard leader Paul Brunel, used cans of oil to set fire to buildings near the Rue Royale and the Rue du Faubourg saint Honore. Following the example set by Brunel, guardsmen set fire to dozens of other buildings on Rue saint Florentine, Rue de Rivoli, Rue de Bac, Rue de Lille, and other streets. The Tuileries Palace was defended by a garrison of 300 National Guard with 30 cannon. They fought a day-long artillery duel with McMahon's army. At seven in the evening, the commander of the garrison, Jules Bergeret gave the order to burn the palace. The walls, floors, drapes, and woodwork were soaked with oil and turpentine, and barrels of gunpowder were placed at the foot of the grand staircase and in the courtyard. Then the fires were set. Bergeret sent a message to the Hotel de Ville, quote, The last vestiges of royalty have just disappeared. I wish that the same will happen to all the monuments of Paris, unquote. The Richelieu Library of the Louvre, connected to the Tuileries, was also fit, set fire and destroyed. The rest of the Louvre was saved by the efforts of the museum curators and fire brigades. Prosper Olivier Lissagueri said that many of the fires were caused by artillery from the French army and that women in the commune were wrongly blamed for arson. Bourgeois historians claim that the National Guard and several communard groups started most of the fires. The National Guard did start fires at the homes associated with the regime of Napoleon III. On 24 May 1871, Brunel and his men went to the Hotel de Ville, which was still the headquarters of the Commune, and its chief executive, Delis Clus. Wounded men were being tended in the halls. National Guard and Commune officers were dumping uniforms, shaving beards, going on the run. Nellis Clouse ordered everyone out of the building while Brunel's men set it on fire. At daylight on 24 March 1871, under a sky black with smoke from the burning buildings, each neighborhood fought on its own. The National Guard disintegrated as soldiers changed into civilian clothes and fled. Now 15,000 communards defended the barricades. Nellis Clouse moved his headquarters from the Hotel de Ville to the City Hall of the 11th arrondissement. More buildings were set afire, including the Palace of Justice, the police headquarters, and important theaters. 
McMahon's troops conducted summary executions of captured Communard soldiers, kangaroo military courts at the Ecole Polytechnique, Chatelet, Luxembourg Palace, and Parc Monceau pronounced death sentences that were immediately carried out. Communards carried out their own executions in reprisal. Raul Rigaud, chairman of the Committee of Public Safety, executed four prisoners himself before he was captured and shot by an army patrol. A delegation of National Guardsmen and Gustave Genton of the Committee of Public Safety came to the new headquarters of the Commune at the City Hall of the 11th Arrondissement. They demanded the immediate execution of the hostages held at the prison of La Roquette. The new prosecutor of the Commune concurred. Genton asked for volunteers for a firing squad and went to the La Roquette prison where many of the hostages were held. Gintone was given a list of hostages and selected six names, including George Darboy, the Archbishop of Paris, and three priests. They were taken into the courtyard and shot. By the end of 24 May 1781, Maximil, Max, McMahon's army had cleared most of the Latin Quarter barricades and held three-fifths of Paris. McMahon had his headquarters at the Quai de d'Orsay, the urgence Insurgents held only the 11th, 12th, 19th, and 20th arrondissements, and parts of the 3rd, 5th, and 13th. De, de Lascus and 20 remaining leaders of the commune were at the city hall of the 13th arrondissement on Place Voltaire. 1,500 National Guardsmen from the 13th arrondissement and the Montfortard district, commanded by Wallery Robles. Robluski fought against three brigades commanded by General de Sisi. On 25 May 1871, the Communards lost the city hall of the 13th Ardisment and moved to a barricade on Place Joan of Arc where 700 were taken prisoner. Robluski and some of his men escaped to the city hall of the 11th Ardisment where he met de Lascluse, chief executive of the Commune, other commune leaders, including Brunel, were wounded and Piat had disappeared. De Lascus offered Robluski the command of the commune forces, which he declined, saying that he preferred to fight as a private soldier. At about 7.30, De Lascus put on his red sash of office, walked unarmed to the barricade on the Place de Chateau d'Eau, climbed to the top, and showed himself to the soldiers and was promptly shot dead. On 26 May 1871, after six hours of heavy fighting, McMahon's armies captured the Place de la Bastille. The National Guard still held parts of the 3rd Arrondissement and had artillery at their strong points at the Buttes, Chamon, and Pere Lachaise, from which they continued to bombard McMahon's men along the Canal Saint Martin. Antoine Clavier, a commune executive, and Emile Goya, a colonel of the National Guard, arrived at La Roquette prison and seized 10 priests, 35 cops, and two civilians. They took them to Rue Haxo, where they were lined up against a wall and shot in groups of 10. According to Prosper Olivier Lissigare, a chronicler of the Commune, 63 people were executed during that week. On the 27th of May, 1871, McMahon launched an attack on the National Guard artillery on the heights of the Buttes Chamon. The heights were captured by the 1st Regiment of the French Foreign Legion. One of the last remaining areas of the National Guard was the cemetery of Pierre Lacaise, defended by about 200 men. In the evening, Army cannon blew down the gates, <clears throat> and the 1st Regiment <clears throat> of Naval Artillery took the cemetery. The last, <clears throat> the last 150 guardsmen, many of them wounded, were surrounded and surrendered. Then they were taken to the Communards' wall and shot. On 28 May 1871, McMahon's army captured the last remaining positions of the Commune. In the morning, they captured La Roquette prison and the remaining 170 hostages. The McMahon army took 1,500 National Guard prisoners at Rue Haxo and 2,000 more at Derosia near Pierre Lacaise. <coughs> A handful of barricades at Rue Rampondeau and Rue de Tourville held out until the middle of the afternoon. Hundreds of prisoners had been shot immediately. Others were taken to the main barracks of the army in Paris and after summary trials were executed there 
and buried in parks, mass graves in parks and squares. McMahon's army officially recorded the capture of 43,522 prisoners during and immediately after Bloody Week. Of these, 1,054 were women, 615 were under the age of 16, they were marched in groups of 150 or 200 to Versailles or the Camp de Satory where half were executed. Trials, trials were held for 15,895 prisoners, of whom 13,500 were found guilty, 95 sentenced to death, 251 to forced labor, 1,169 to deportation, usually to New Caledonia, 3,147 to simple deportation, 1,257 to solitary confinement, 1,305 to prison for more than a year, and 2,054 to prison for less than a year. On August, 7 August 1871, a show trial began for the commune leaders who survived. A panel of senior, seven senior army officers tried them. Fair was commenced to death. Five women were put on trial for participation in the commune, including the Red Virgin Louise Michelle. She was deported to New Caledonia. In October 1871, a commission of the National Assembly reviewed the sentences. 310 of those convicted were pardoned. 286 had their sentences reduced and 1,295 commuted. On the 3rd of March in 1879, a partial amnesty was granted that allowed 400 of the 600 deportees sent to New Caledonia to return. <coughs> it pardoned 2,000 of the 2,000 prisoners sentenced in absentia. A general amnesty was granted on 11 July 1880, allowing the remaining 543 condemned prisoners and 262 sentenced in their absence to return to France. In 1876, Prosper Olivier Lizagari, the journalist who had fought on the barricades, wrote a highly popular history of the commune while in exile in London. Vladimir Lenin said later that Lizagari's estimated De estimate demonstrated ruling class brutality. 20,000 killed in the streets. Lessons. Bourgeoisie will stop at nothing. And that brings us to the end of this particular lecture. And we'll pick up uh, France again when we get to the uh, First Imperialist War of 1914.